Uh, hi everyone, welcome to the April edition of the Haskellers Meetup. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome Marco today, uh, who came all the way from Northern Italy to us, so thank you very much for taking this journey upon you. It was a nice journey. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, Marco is a mathematician, um, uh, worked there for a long time and uh, did uh, his PhD in abstract algebra and then uh, became a software engineer. Uh, spend a lot of time working with PHP, uh, but now uh, today he's going to tell us about Haskell, and um, he's also very excited about chocolate. So if you have some recommendations at the end, then uh, do share. And uh, if questions come up during the talk, don't hesitate. But uh, yeah, uh, let's give it up for Marco. Yeah. Thanks a lot. So I came up here because yeah, I would like to share uh, some work I've been doing lately on uh, well mostly on a library, a Haskell library called CREM, which stands for Composable, Reproducible, uh, Executable Machines. And I would like to start with this, just starting from the beginning where I started to, to arrive here, which is a story which does not start with functional programming at all. Uh, it starts more with something related to domain-driven design. So just a question I tend to ask, has any one of you saw this picture before or is familiar with it? Probably no. Okay, that's even better. So I can just share with you my perspective on it and you not have any bias on it. So this is basically the explanation of a domain exploration workshop, uh, which is fairly popular in Italy because it was invented by an Italian guy and extremely popular in the domain-driven design world. So basically what you do is you gather in a room a lot of domain experts and developers and whatever, all kind of figures that you have in your company. And together you make this kind of workshop to explore a domain. Might it be a new thing that you want to develop or something that you already have implemented and you want to understand better where are the pain points, where more efforts should be dedicated. And so basically uh, how does the workshop works? So basically there's so-called unlimited modeling space. You basically take a really huge wall, white wall, without anything, and everyone has access to a lot of post-its and some pens, basically. And it works that you just take post-its, write something on it, and put them on the wall. And every post-it uh, with different color has a different meaning. So let's just go through them to understand a little bit what are the pieces of this kind of workshop. And then let's, afterwards we'll come to why this is kind of interesting for, for what I'll take about later. So what are the main pieces? So the workshop itself is called uh, event storming. So the main components are events, specifically domain events, which are the changes which happen in your application throughout the life of the application itself. In particular, the events which are relevant for the domain expert, for the users of the platform. So some examples could be, I don't know, a user registered or payment completed or item added to cart or withdrawal uh, executed correctly. Uh, basically any state change which happens in the application uh, which can store some relevant data to decide what to do with the application and which data needs to be shown to the user. And this is basically our state changes. So it's kind of what happened really in your application. Then the second piece are the blue stickies, which represent commands, which are basically uh, what the user wants out of your platform. So what the user requests, uh, what are the action, the intention of the user. Basically the user will say, please, add this item to the card, please uh, pay this sum to complete the checkout, uh, please withdraw this money from my bank account. The user will request things out of your application. And the other part, it's down here, the color is not so visible, but it's just the thing down there, uh, which are so-called read models. And it's basically all those data which are needed by the user to take decisions. So basically you know that you have 200 bucks in your bank account, so you'll try to withdraw 100 and not 250, maybe because you know that will probably fail. 
or you saw that you already have an item in your card, so you're not trying to add that again. So basically, there you have all the information which are needed by the user to make decision to what to do next uh, with the system. And then there are some more pieces, which are basically, well, these three pieces, which were, uh, again, events, commands, and read models. There are three other pieces which are more like process-like stuff. And the first one are aggregates, so-called aggregates, even if the name is not the best one. Uh, but it's basically that piece of logic in your application which decide, decides how to deal with commands coming from the user and decide how to basically alter the state of your system. So basically, it really is the part of the core logic of your application will decide there and will decide the user is requesting to do this thing, can I do it or not? And if I can, what will really happen inside the application? Then there are the so-called policies, which basically describe the reactive part of your logic, of your application. So basically, whenever something happens, you want to react in some way. So basically, a user registered, so we would like to send him an email. Or, I don't know, you withdraw some money, and now you have uh, very few money in a bank account, so we'll notify you that it's better if you don't withdraw uh, more until you get more money in your bank account or things like that. So think uh, the key word there is whenever. So whenever this happens, we want to react and do this other thing. And the last part are projections, which are basically uh, things which take all the data that you have in your events, so basically all the changes which happened in your system, and aggregate those data to create the data which you want to show your user. For example, uh, you have a bunch of events which are gonna tell you this item was added to the card, this item was added to the card, this item was added to the card, but you don't want to present to the user just a list of actions that it, they did to add items to the card. You want to present them just the state of the card. So that's the role of projections. You want to basically aggregate data to show the user uh, the data that they want. So at this point, I've been talking about uh, domain exploration workshops. So uh, actually, the main uh, point of this talk should be talking about state machines and how to implement them in Haskell. So what's the relation between this kind of workshop and state machines? So basically, the key insight here is that aggregates, projections, and policies are nothing else than stateful processes, and they could all be implemented as state machines. So the, my basically idea, so with this kind of workshop, what you get is not only a description of your system which can be understood by non-technical people, so also by business people and domain experts in general, and, but also you can get a really nice architecture, basically, because you have a flow of how things actually go through your application. So you have commands, which are processed by aggregates to produce events. You can react to events in some way to create new commands, basically. And then you take events and you project them to create the read models. And that's basically all your application. So the, the drawing that we have is not only an explanation of a workshop, but a really nice architecture diagram if you want to see it that way. And basically this architecture diagram is composed just by three state machines, which might be huge, might be very complex, but they are just state machines. And state machines are quite really interesting things because they're really composable, they can be serialized very well, uh, uh, they have a graphical representation, they have many good properties that you might want to, to use in your implementation. Uh, so just to uh, briefly recap what we saw here, so the three state machines that we're talking about is aggregates, which basically have the role to process commands from the users and decide which events to emit. So they will take commands and emit events, and the internal state will be needed to decide what to do with a given command. 
projections basically just take events and aggregate them to create the read model, so to create the information that you want to serve to the user. And policies also just basically react to events to create new commands in a stateful way, because maybe sometimes you want to do something uh, with an event, some other times you don't want to do that. For example, uh, I don't know, um, a, a typical example of a policy is just uh, interact with external services. So maybe you receive an event which, oh, sorry, uh, which says, okay, um, we have a payment request from the user. You want to react to that by contacting a payment gateway. And that will produce a new command, but maybe you will contact your payment gateway depending on an internal state of your system. So, and so, I hope I convinced you that this kind of is, could be a nice way to architect an application just by using state machines. So the natural question here could be, okay, uh, we understand that we can build a nice system with just state machines. So how should we encode state machines in our system to create a system which keep the good properties of state machines? So if you look on Wikipedia, for example, the definition of a mealy machine, uh, you will find a definition which says a mealy machine is a sex tuple done by these six things. And so it's basically three sets, uh, which in Haskell wise translate into three types. Uh, so in this kind is you have the type representing your state space, uh, the possible inputs of your system, and the possible outputs of your machine. And then you have a value, which is the initial state of your machine. So where do we start from? And then, well, if you look on Wikipedia, you have two functions. I just collapse them into one here. Uh, it's basically one function which tells you, given your current state and the input that you receive, you need to decide what's the next state of the machine and what's the output. And all right, so basically it's just a stateful computation uh, put together with a state. In fact, if you look, try to look on Google and search for mealy machines, what you get is something quite similar but slightly different. Actually, there's in the machines library, you get this definition, so you get uh, this mealy data type, which has only two type parameters. So as you see, it doesn't have the state. And so it is a little bit different than the previous one, also because it doesn't have two things in it. So it, it's not a record with two things, but it has only one. It's just basically a single function which takes an input and returns an output and a new machine. So basically, it internalizes the handling of the state. It doesn't expose the state to the user. And the nice thing about such data type is that it's really composable. So for example, you can do very easily sequential composition. So if you have two machines, one consuming A's and producing B's, and one consuming B's and producing C's, you can compose them sequentially. So first you run your first state machine, uh, you get some Bs, and you feed them to your second state machine to get some Cs. So basically you just first run the first machine, then run the second machine. Very easy. But there are really many other ways you can compose um, such stateful processes. So for example, suppose you have two completely unrelated machines, so one going from A to B, and the other one going from C to D, what you can do is just basically can run them in parallel. So if you provide as input both an A and a C, you can give the A to the first machine, give the C to the second machine, run both of them and collect the outputs to get a B and a D. And similarly, you can run two machines alternatively, which means rather either one or the other. So if you have two machines, one going from A to B and one going from C to D, and you provide as input either an A or a C, well, if you provide an A, you can use the first machine. If you provide a C, you can run the second machine and get 
either a B and a D. Quick yeah. question. Yeah. So you showed us two, two representations before. Wouldn't these, fu these functions also, it would also be possible to represent these functions with the first representation, right? So you can yeah, so the question is, we have two representation for state machines, and we saw that for the second representation, we have these nice composition properties. Uh, does this thing hold also for the first representation? Well, we go a bit uh, into that uh, further on, but uh, let me answer rapidly. The answer is that the additional type parameter that you have, basically the state, it's quite an issue because you basically need to compute what's the state space of the composed machine, which could be done. I mean, theoretically, you know what's the state space, so you could implement uh, something which computes that, which is also at the type level, so it's also a little bit more complicated than doing it at the value level. So with the second time, it's easier, let's say. It's possible with the first, but, uh, and also, well, I'll get to another point later on uh, in the presentation. Uh, and then uh, there's also other ways we can compose machines. This is kind of, kind of a weird way of composing machines, which, uh, emerge kind of naturally out of the architecture I had in the beginning. So I call this feedback. Uh, basically what you do, you have one machine going from A to a list of Bs, and one machine going from B to a list of As. And how does that composition work? So basically you take an A, you produce a list of Bs, and then you run this second machine a lot of time, as many times and as the Bs that you get out of the first machine. And what you basically get is a list of As. And so you can run the first machine as many times as the As that you collected here. And you get again a list of Bs and you cycle basically until one of the two machines returns you the empty list. At, the point, at that point you stop. So basically this could go on forever, uh, but if you implement things correctly, it should stop and do exactly what you want. And Question? Yeah. So the, the way you did it, yeah. But so that if you stop in the wrong state, then you backtrack a little bit? Uh, not really, because in the end, what you're interested in is just a list of Bs. So if you get here to the empty list of As, what you basically do is we return the empty list of Bs and then you're done. You keep the list of Bs that you collected with all the previous cycles. Oh, so you're concatenating all the... Exactly. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. And this basically to connect with what I showed you before is basically, uh, if you remember, you had the aggregate going from commands to events and then you had the policies going from events to commands. So basically you want that to form a cycle. So uh, you perform your command to get some events. Uh, you react to the events, getting maybe back some commands. Uh, then you perform again uh, your aggregate on the commands and then you continue to cycle there until basically there's nothing more to do. And the main issue I have with this encoding of state machine is it's just a function. So a function is nice, but the only thing that which you can do with a function is apply an argument to it, run it. And this is cool, but maybe there's something else you want to do with a state machine. So for example, you want to extract some documentation out of it. So I was talking before, for example, you have uh, machines can be represented graphically. Maybe you want to generate a graphical representation of your state machine from your code. Uh, or you want to impose some invariants on your state machine. So basically you want to say, okay, I don't want every possible transition in my state space to be allowed. I want to say that from state A, I can only go to state B and not to state C. And this is not possible with this kind of implementation. Uh, and this turned out actually to be a practical problem in systems that I saw implementing that architecture in the beginning, where basically people were documenting things 
separately from the code that they were writing, which, I mean, usually happens for many things. Uh, but that's usually a problem because then your documentation becomes stale and it's not up to date and it's just confusing. Uh, actually, what happens with a workshop typically is that you do the workshop, you get your nice representation on a wall, you take a picture of that, and then that's your documentation. But then, obviously, when you go to the implementation part, you start making changes, introducing new things, splitting things around, and, and your picture that you have, it's not really easy to change it. So I wanted something which was able to connect the two aspects uh, directly. So basically the documentation side, the invariance and imposition, and the implementation. I want something which was able to connect uh, those pieces. And so I thought, uh, my initial idea I had here was let's try to strengthen a little bit the type of our state machine. So introduce a new parameter. So other than input and output, now we have also a topology, which I'm going to explain in a minute, uh, which has a topology vertex kind, so it's something a little bit fancier than normal types. But basically, what's a topology? So a topology is nothing else of the list of edges in a graph. So basically, what I'm doing here, I'm taking the state space and describing which are the allowed transitions. So I can go from A to B, but I cannot go from A to C, from A to D, and whatever. So basically, if you want a graphical representation, this is one example of a topology. So for example, from the state node data, I can only go to collected user data. And from collected user data, I can go either to collected loan details first, or to received credit bureau data first, and so on and so forth. I think you, you, get the, you get the idea. You basically uh, describe which are the allowed transition in your, in your state machine. And you just feed that information at the type level in, in your machine definition. So at this point, what can you do with, with this? So you add basically the topology in the type, and that basically allows you to do two things, mainly. So it allows you to enforce only the execution of allowed transitions. So if you, in your topology, you said from state A, I can only go to state B, you can use that information to get a compilation error if you try to implement your code saying that you will go from A to C. And how does that work? Let's try to go through this. So we have this data machine with the topology and inputs and outputs. And it has a single constructor machine with an existential state type. And then as the initial uh, uh, machine state machine implementation I showed you, you have two things. You have your initial state, which is just where you start your machine. And then you have your action function, which is a fancy encoding with what we had in the beginning. So basically what you do, you take your initial state, basically the state in the initial vertex, you take your input and you return this action result, uh, but this action result is just, it has a lot of five parameters, uh, just one constructor, but basically what it is, is just a pair of an output and the final state. So basically what we're doing back here is nothing very much different from what we were doing in the beginning. So basically we take the initial state, we take the input, and we return the output and the final state. So the idea is exactly the same. So having one function, we take the state, initial state, input, and returns the output and the final state. The things that made me add all of this other types is precisely this, because I want to constrain this function to allow transition from the initial vertex to the final vertex, only transitions allowed by the topology. So I can basically use the information that I store at the type level to constrain this function, basically to compile only if I use allow transitions, which allow transition basically is looking at what 
you described in the topology itself. And the other cool thing that you could do is you can basically use the topology information that you stored in your type uh, to uh, extract information about your state machine without running it. So in particular, uh, you can retrieve your topology from the type level to the value level. So to do this, you need to do some uh, singletons uh, magic, but basically what the function does, it takes a machine which has a topology at the type level and brings the topology down to the value level. And the implementation is extremely simple, uh, but to make that work, you need some kind of heavy machinery up here coming from the singletons library, which basically says, okay, I allow you to migrate information from the type level to the value level. And this places actually some restriction to the types that you can use for your topology. Basically, your topology cannot be too big, otherwise this won't work. But still, it's, uh, it's good enough, I think. But uh, what's the, so up to this point, it looks everything is nice and shiny because we have our uh, machine type, which we can run, uh, which uh, we can use to uh, express our environments, basically saying that certain transitions are not allowed. And we can also use to extract uh, the topology information. And maybe after we got that topology information on the value level, we can use it to just produce a beautiful drawing. But what's the problem, what's the issue with this representation? Well, it comes a little bit back to what we were saying before, uh, is that composition becomes harder. Because now you have this parameter here, and so when we want, for example, to do a simple sequential composition, uh, you have one machine which has a topology T1 and another machine which has a topology T2, so what's the topology of the composed machine? So in theory, well, if you think about it, uh, it's not super hard to figure out, but still this is a computation that you need to perform uh, at the type level, which is, well, more complex than doing it at the value level, so it brings it in quite some complexity. Uh, and also the other point is it breaks the usage of standard type classes, which Haskell uses for composing stuff, for example, like arrow or category, just because it has this additional type parameter which these type classes don't take into consideration. And so my question at this point when I came to this kind of point in the implementation is that, uh, can we get the best of both worlds? So can we get a data type which is easy to compose but still allows us to uh, express our invariance and maybe also uh, allows us to create a beautiful drawing out the definition of our state machine. Uh, well, I wouldn't be here if the answer wasn't yes, so I don't know if this is the best that you can actually achieve, but let's try to see what's one possible solution to, to this question. And let's start thinking together what, what can be done. So. Uh, the first thing you want to do is you want to remove additional type parameters from your type signature because that was something which created issues with previous representation. So you just start from blank, you just define a new data type which has just input and outputs as type parameters. And okay, then second thing you do is you say okay, I still would like to use my previous data type, uh, the one with the topology in, in the type signature. And so you add a new constructor, which here we call basic, which basically construct the state machine given a machine with the topology. So basically what you do here is somehow you make the topology existential. You just kind of forget about it. You're not really forgetting about it because when you do pattern matching then on a state machine, which is the new thing without topology, and you want to produce any, uh, anything out of it, 
So you just pattern match on it. You do basic machine, and this machine will allow you uh, to uh, retrieve its topology information. So pattern matching basically allows you to get back the topology information that you were kind of forgetting here. So you're kind of, more than forgetting is you're hiding it, but you're able to retrieve it later. And then the next idea is, okay, we have one constructor. Well, let's add all the constructors we need to make this data type composable. So just add a constructor to make sequential composition. Uh, we just take a state machine from A to B, one from B to C, and returns one from A to C. And then basically, once you have this, you just, it's a pattern, you repeat it. So I do the same for parallel with just fixing uh, the inputs and outputs that you need to have. Uh, alternative, when you put either here and there. And feedback, you do the same. So Basically, you substitute the functions that you had previously with constructors in this new data type. And at this point, uh, what your new data type looks like is just basically uh, an abstract syntax tree uh, where the leaves are machines with the topology and all the other nodes are just uh, nodes which describe how to compose the the subtrees. Question? So here there should be basic nodes between the lowest level bracket. So yeah, these ones are basic nodes, uh, all the leaves here. Yeah. So uh, I don't write explicitly basic machine one, basic machine two, but yeah, all the leaves are basic machines. Yeah, so the question is, are there cases when you can express the topology of the composition of machine? Well, yes, and you can do it because in theory, you know what's the topology of the sequential composition of machines. So you, well, I'm gonna show it later, but basically what you do is just compute the topology of the subtrees and then you know how the topology of the composed machine is, which is basically it's always the product, the Cartesian product, more or less, of the topologies. And so you, you can use your theoretical knowledge to uh, know how to deal with composition on a case-by-case -case basis. Basically, when you represent things, uh, you want to compute the to bigger topology, you know that the topology follows certain rules when you compose. If you want to do other stuff, you just do other stuff. Basically what you're doing here is you're creating a free structure and then depending on the operation that you want to do on your free structure, you interpret it in different ways. I mean, what, what I meant more was like, um, could you have a case where you compose the machines but you want to impose a, a topology that sort of crosses across both machines? Okay, so uh, question like, is, Right, so the question is, uh, basically, what if you want to impose invariants on the composition of machines? Good question, and I don't have a nice answer for that. So currently, uh, you can impose invariants basically with a topology only on the leaves, only on the basic things. So to do what you're proposing, you should basically, uh, what you could do is you could implement your basic machines compose them computing the topology at the type level. So you could still do that. And then modifying stuff there. So you, probably there's still a way to, to do that, but it's definitely more complex than what, you, what I'm describing here. All right, and this is composable uh, because just take category, for example, as a type class. Uh, so state machine, well, the identity is just basic of identity, where identity is a machine which just has trivial state, so it's just one single state, and for any input, it 
gives back that input as output. So nothing, nothing fancy. And composition is just flip of the sequential constructor. Same for the strong type class, which is basically what gives you parallel composition in the profunctor hierarchy. And the implementation is just second equal parallel of ID, where ID is, oh, wrong button, is that ID. And similarly for choice was what gives you uh, alternative composition in the profunctor hierarchy. Uh, the implementation is right prime equal alternative ID. So extremely simple. And when you want to execute this kind of machines, basically you want to run them, you want to really compute the outputs given the inputs. The type signature is this, so uh, you take a state machine from A to B, you take an input of type A, and you want to get back a B and a new version of your state machine. Which, if you look carefully, this was exactly the definition of, the first definition of state machine, the, actually the second uh, that we saw. And that's the interface you want to expose to your users. And to run, uh, this data structure in this fashion is just pattern match. If you have a basic machine, basically, um, oh, wrong button. Basically, the machine itself had an initial state and an action, and we provide an input, and the action was a function, which, given a state and an input, could produce an output and a new version of the machine. But now we have the state given by the machine itself, we have the input, so we can apply those two arguments to the action to get our output and the new state of the machine, basically the new version of the machine. When we have sequential composition of two machines, well, what you do, basically you first run your first machine, given the input that you get, you get out an output and a new version of the first machine, you use the output of the first machine as an input of the second machine to get an output of the second machine and a new version of your second machine. And then basically the output of your whole uh, composition is just the output of the second machine and the new machine, which is made by the new version, the sequential composition of the new versions of both machines. And similarly, for parallel, what you do is basically you run your, both your machines to get an output from the first machine and a new version of the, your first machine, second, uh, same for the second machine. And then you collect basically all the things that you got. So the output for both machines and you basically, the new version of your composed machine is just a parallel composition of the new version of the subtrees machines. And similarly for alternative F and feedback, it's the same. Now, if you want to uh, represent your machine in some kind of diagram, you want to create some graphical representation of your machine, what you can do, for example, you can define a mermaid data type, which is just some text wrapped in new type, so nothing fancy. You can do better than this. And what we want to do, for example, is we want to take a state machine and produce some mermaid representation. Mermaid, I guess you all know it, is just a way of creating diagrams out of a string of text. But this is a way to create a graphical representation of your machine. So one way to do it is, for example, uh, when we process a basic machine, so what we have available now is the topology function, which we defined previously, which was basically taking the topology from the type level to the value level. And now that we have the topology at the value level, we can use uh, any function that we can define to render that value uh, as a mermaid diagram. And we, when we have composition, so for example, sequential composition, what we do is fairly simple, a little bit more complex than what I'm showing here in the slide is a little bit simplified, but just glue code, let's say, I omitted it. So basically you render the first machine, you render the second machine, and then you put an arrow between the first machine and the second machine to, to get the flow 
of how your machines are working. And so basically, this way, you get a way to represent your machine. So this is, this is not showing extremely well, but let, let me explain. Uh, so this is a diagram that you can generate with uh, CREM. Given uh, a definition of state machines, which implements the architectural diagram, which I showed you in the beginning of the talk. So as you saw, we have an aggregate, which is the part of your system which takes the business decision, let's say. Then this is linked as a feedback with the policy, which basically reacts to, uh, reacts to this, after this state, basically. So th there's an event here uh, which this policy reacts to. And then there's the projection, uh, which is just a sequential composition of this whole machine and then the projection. And this is just, yeah, another sequential composition, but it's just an implementation detail. So basically what you get is a possibly uh, understandable diagram of what your application does uh, directly out of your implementation. So this is something which I believe you can fairly easily use as documentation of your software, which basically tells, uh, okay, your application works this way. So you have this first, everything goes through here. This is the possible state transition which can happen inside this machine. And then these four machines are linked in this way. There should be some arrows here, which I think are really hard to see. Uh, so imagine that there are some arrows uh, beyond there. And I would like to finish with a little demo, if we have some time. So, well, before this, do you, do you have some questions, maybe? Uh, yeah. Uh, could you show the definition of the basic machine again? I'm really puzzled as to how you save the topology inside that. Uh, So, so yeah. This is one piece. This one, yeah, yeah. Ah. Okay. There are some constraints. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Uh, there are some constraints missing here. Uh, so, since now we're going to take a look at the code. Actually, I can show you directly the code to show you. All right, no connection. So, okay, this is. Uh, there is um, <coughs> a Wi-Fi you can sign into. Uh, you need to enter your phone number and then you get a code. All right, too bad I changed page. Uh, okay, so sorry about this. Actually, let me do it. Yeah, I'll show you. I'll show you the code. Uh, on my laptop, so. All right. So here is the real definition. So I guess that some increase of the font is in place here. So basically this is the real thing which is happening. So you see that here you have this base machine which then creates a state machine. Uh, this also is effectful, so we have monad laying around there uh, because you can do effects if you want. And then the constraints are this one. So basically, the first three are the relevant ones, but basically are the ones which allow you to basically somehow store the topology somewhere and retrieve the topology information at the value level afterwards. Yeah, th thanks for the question. Uh, that clarifies things a bit. So, uh, maybe since we're there, um, yeah? so in the very beginning, uh, you showed a representation of state machines that captures the state as a value in the yes in a record, uh, and now we've made that a sort of uh, it's captured in some some kind of closure. Um, 
what implication does that have to like observability or debugging programs that are implemented this way? Yeah, so the question is, uh, in the first implementation, we were exposing the state to the user. Now, basically, the state is kind of somehow hidden. So yeah, this hides the state from the user, so the user doesn't have a direct way to introspect the user uh, from outside the state machine. What you can do is you can expose your state in the output. So basically, you consider a state machine as a state as a black box, which takes some inputs and expose some outputs, and you, you don't really know what's happening in there. If you want to inspect what's happening in there, you need to expose it uh, in your outputs. So it's a trade-off, obviously. And right, so I want to show you uh, uh, the demo. So let's first play a little bit. So to show you what this is about. So this is just a thing that a friend of mine did a lot of time ago with Petri nets, and I just took it and did it again with state machines. And uh, no. Uh, bigger. So Cabal run Hobbit game. So this is basically kind of a version of a Hobbit inspired game initially built for Commodore 64 uh, in the 80s. So basically is a, can you see or should I increase? I, I can increase the font even make it what about this? Is it better? No. Yeah. The other side, I, I, it's still better in the line. Yeah. It's not always you, it works, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, so basically it's a terminal based game, uh, an adventure game. You have some information from the game and you need to make some decisions. And so it says, welcome to the Hobbit adventure game. You are in a tunnel-like hole. You can only go east to the Lone Lands. So what you do is you go east. And okay, now you are in the Lone Lands. You can either go west to a tunnel-like hole, where you were before, or go east to the Trolls Clearing. So we don't go, want to go back. So we continue to go east. Now we are in the Trolls Clearing. Uh, we can either go north to the Trolls path or go to Rivendell. So I'm just going to do the happy path so you don't get too bored. And so we go north. And here we can go back south or wait a bit. So we just wait a bit. And here you see the first time that we're in the same place as before. So we're still in the Trolls path, but the message has changed. First it was saying you can wait a bit now it says you can wait some more. So it, there's some statefulness in there. That's good because we're doing state machines. And what we do is we go south. And once we go south, we are back to the troll screen where we were before. And now we have one more option. We can get the key for the troll's cave. So we get the key. And now we can go back north. Once we go back north, there's another option for unlocking the door to the Trolls Cave. So I need to type it correctly, unlock door. Okay, and now we can also go north to the Trolls Cave. So we go north again, and we are in the Trolls Cave. So basically this is all of the game. I mean, this is just a little demo to show you that you can use state machines to implement a uh, kind of uh, terminal-based game based on state machines. And now what I want to show you is the actual implementation of this. So examples, the Hobbit, and let's close this. So basically what you need to do to create that game, I mean, I'm not showing you all the IO stuff which is needed, just show you the domain logic of it. So you need to define the possible commands that you want to give to your state machine. In this case, you can go east, west, north, south, wait, get the key, or unlock the door. These are all the possible commands throughout the whole game. And then basically the outputs of your machine will just be strings. 
So in this case, it's nothing fancy. You just need to tell the user, uh, tell the terminal, which is the message which needs to be printed uh, for that particular state. And then you define your topology. So as you see, uh, it's wrapped in some template Haskell with singletons. And what you do here is you define the possible vertices of the graph of your topology. So these are basically all the places where you can be in the game. So you can be in the tunnel like hole, Lone Lands, or Clearings, Rivendell, Misty Mountain, Trolls Path, or Trolls Cave. And then you define the real topology, which basically is saying, okay, from tunnel like hole, I can only go to the Lone Lands. From the Lone Lands, I can either go to the tunnel like hole or to the Trolls Clearing and so on and so forth. You basically list all the possible transition that are allowed in the game. And then you define the real state of the system because for certain, say, vertices in your graph, you might want to store a little bit of more states. So for example, when you are in the Trolls Clearing, you can either have a key or not have a key. So you want to store more information in the specific vertex of your graph. Then you need to define basically all the possible messages that you want to return to your user. So just a bunch of strings, basically for every possible state, you just list a string and for certain state, you print one string or the other depending on the real state that you're in. So in this case, if we have no key, we print something. If the day dawn, we print something else. If we got the key, we print something else. If the door unlocks, something else again. And then basically you have the definition of the machine itself. So you see, it, well, we take the initial input as an input, uh, initial vertex as an input, and then we define uh, a machine constrained by our topology, receiving as input the Hobbit commands and outputting the Hobbit messages. And it's what you would expect from a state machine. So you define your initial state, which is just what we're passing here as input. And then the action is basically a big case statement which says, oh, you are in this state and you received this input, then you're gonna print this message out. So for example, if you are in a tunnel-like hold state and you receive the go east message, you move to the lone lens state. Uh, otherwise, you just stay where you are. I mean, there's not a lot of error handling here or good user experience. So if the user provides, uh, let's say the wrong input, it will just will be presented with the same message as before. So this could certainly be improved, but I think it still proves the point of how you would go in structuring such applications. And here is just a repetition of the same pattern. So you have a state, you have an input, and you decide what to do with that state and that input. And that's basically it. Uh, after that, your logic, the logic of your application is completely defined. And what you need to do is just to wrap everything in a little bit IO stuff, which just take the inputs from the, the, the terminal and print things to the terminal. And the cool thing that you can still do is other than running the game itself and playing it, you can run another executable, uh, which is Hobbit map. What? All right. Uh, which is producing this, which is a mermaid uh, version of the diagram, which I should have here, no reloading the page, uh, which is exactly this. So this is what got printed in the terminal. And this, if you put it in a mermaid rendering engine, you get this output. And so this is basically a representation of the map of your game. 
So you start in a tunnel like hole, from there you can go to the lone lens, from the lone lens you can go either to the tunnel like hole or to the troll screen. And for example, from here, it's evident that once you get to the troll screen, you cannot go back. And, and then, well, there's the rest of the, the map, basically. And I was here, and let me get back, just to say that this is all I had for you today, and I'll be glad to take any question and feedback you have. If you want to contact me on this or anything else, Haskell related or domain driven design related, these are my contacts. Feel free to ping me anytime. <laughs> Question. Yes, um, so I saw that in the topology for the Hobbit game, there is always a link between the, whatever it is, the path and the cave which is something that then you opened up later with the key. So does the, it does, in the actual state machine, does that transition only exist in the state where the user has the key? Or could you always do that secretly? Or how, like, does it work in the code that you prevent certain state transitions? That run so the, the question more or less uh, uh, is that in the example that we saw, Certain transitions are prevented to run and some others are not. In particular, the one to go from the cave to somewhere else, where was it? It was to unlock the door and then go into the cave. Right, so let, let's go back and see that because that's uh, in fact an interesting uh, point. So the topology itself says that from the trolls path, you can go, let's say, back to the Trolls clearing, or you can go through the Trolls cave. And the topology itself does not say that you need a key to go to the Trolls cave. So that, that's an invariant that we are not imposing with this topology. What you actually have here, uh, and then we're defining this other Hobbit state uh, space which just basically adds this key state data type which basically say do you have the key or not uh, in certain uh, places of the of the map of the topology and what basically this gives you a two layers way of defining your state space one layer is tracked in the topology and one layer is not and you can decide what to put there what to put in the topology and what not to put there. For example, in this case, I could have uh, put all the information in the topology and the topology would have tracked the fact that I could go to the troll's cave only with a key. I could have done that. But for example, if instead of a key state, which is just four values, I had an integer here, I don't know, the number of flowers I collected through the path, uh, that would not be possible because the constraint that you have uh, to actually build all the things or to render, so all the things coming from singletons, basically integer do not satisfy those constraints. So you cannot put an integer in your topology. And so in that case, you must really put the integer outside. So I think I mentioned it uh, previously. Usually your topology does not need to be too big. So you need to uh, decide carefully what goes in there and what does not. But you still, in certain cases, you have the ability to decide, okay, I want to be really careful with this environment. So I put the information there. Other times you would say, okay, maybe let's be a little bit more permissive on this thing and rely on the implementation. But keep the topology more, more lean. Uh, a question about <clears throat> the, um, the guarantees you get from the, the, from the topology and the type and the representation, the graphical representation. So sort of with the, with the types you get, 
the guarantee that you're not going to transition to a state that is illegal, mm -hmm. but you're not getting the guarantee that your implementation is actually transitioning to all the states that are legal. Right. The graphical representation is based on the topology and the types, right? So if I make a, so for example, if one of the cases I make a typo and instead of going into the cave, I go back into the, what was it, the, the, the opening? Clearing. Um, uh, then the graph would still show me that I can go to both even though the implementation makes a mistake, right? Yeah, so the question is uh, basically uh, the re graphical representation takes the information out of the topology which is somehow connected to the implementation uh, but the implementation could actually be more strict than the topology itself. And yeah, that's true. Uh, so the topology itself could allow more than the implementation actually does, uh, which mean could be a bug, could be a feature, but uh, it's like that at the moment. Uh, one really cool thing uh, would be to generate the topology out of the implementation. I'm not there yet, <laughs> but I mean, that, that would be really cool. Uh, I mean, there's many things, uh, many ways such a project could be improved. Uh, this is one, so not having to think beforehand to the topology is just generated out of the implementation, but that is basically taking a function, introspecting a function to generate data type. So I expect it not to be extremely easy. Yeah, yeah not meant as a criticism. Just no, no, no. For understanding. Absolutely fair. It's not the first time that it comes up. So we had another question there. Yeah. So the, the question is, if in my implementation I transition to another state, uh, to an illegal state, what will happen? So, well, you get a compilation error. Which one? Let's see uh, if I'm able to get it. So... You can't go from the fast track to low land. So that uh, yeah, let, uh, so the, the trolls cave and let's go from the tunnel-like hole to the troll scheme. And you see here, uh, could not deduce allow transition, blah, blah, blah. So somehow it tells you the, the topology that you have does not allow you to transition from the tunnel-like hole to the troll scheme. It's potentially not the best error message that you can get. Uh, could be improved, but it's still not completely ununderstandable. I mean, uh, if you read it, you kind of understand that the transition from this state to that state is not allowed. Thanks. Well. So, but related to that, I mean, the, the information is already in the first line, so that's already pretty useful. Yeah. But uh, could this be uh, extended with custom type errors to make it even more friendly? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the question is, could this be extended with custom type errors? So I, I guess so, and would be nice. Yeah, definitely. Have you measured any performance? Tricky question, have you measured any performance? And easy answer, no. <laughs> what do you expect the performance to be like? Uh, question, how do you expect the performance to be like? So actually my expectation is that this could make compilation time a little bit slow because there's a lot of information going on uh, in the types. But at runtime, I'm not expecting too much overhead because basically what you do is just is compute functions. Just take the state, take the input, and compute the output and the new state. So, I mean, I didn't build really big systems with this, so I don't have a benchmark of really big stuff. But for the examples I tried, uh, which are, I mean, uh, fairly, yeah, let's say are examples, not production systems, I didn't notice any kind of uh, performance issue. But, I mean, obviously the good answer would be measure it. 
Yeah, good. Being Go ahead. Being uh, anthropology, you mentioned that you can use the state to hold like an integer or something, but what if you do have a lot of rules that say how does the compilation time scale with the number of, of, uh, of, the, with the number of uh, possible residues? And secondly, uh, how about fully connected topologies? I didn't get the second question. Uh, fully connected topologies with the whole graph. All right. Uh, well, the question is, uh, what if you have many topologies? How do compilation time scale with that? And what if you have fully connected topologies? Uh, what happens in that case? So the answer again is, I don't really know, because uh, I didn't do any benchmark, actually. Uh, so up to now, this is just an experiment. Um, I think that for fully connected topologies, an uh, interesting way to go is just basically go the other way around. So instead of defining which are the allowed transitions, is to define which are the not allowed ones. So you have basically two constructors for your topology. One will be basically a whitelist, and one will be an allow list, and the other, win, uh, the other will be a uh, uh, disallow list. And that could basically let you decide where to start. So you want to just allow some transition or you want to disallow some. So depending if your topology has a lot of edges or just a few of them, you could decide where to start. So that could be an approach you could take there. Let's thank Marco again. Well, thank you all. I have fun doing this thing, so. Yeah. And um, as uh, what? Yeah, and I'm open for work. So if you have a position or no companies which are hiring, you know, glad to receive any input. Thank you. Um, and as usual, we have uh, reserved space uh, in the ale house for those who would like to join us for uh, drinks or food um, afterwards. You can just uh, follow us. Uh, and the rest of you, thank you for coming, and uh, see you next time. Thanks a lot.